Hello and welcome to A Closer Look. Mark Miller and Mark Shine. And Mark, this is going to be our Christmas show. Yeah. So we've got some things that we'll discuss there and get excited about the holidays just five days away. But first, some basketball, yeah, right? Absolutely. All right, well, let's review some of last week's top games. And I've got the first one. Fort Recovery at Delphi St. John's. Fort Recovery won this one 56-55 in overtime. Matt Binn hit a last-second shot for DSJ. Tim Krieger and Jared Wurst both had 16 points for Fort Recovery. Kayla Martin, 15 points, 9 rebounds. Makaya Cox, 13 points, 8 rebounds. That puts DSJ 1 and 2, 0 and 2 in the MAC already. Fort Recovery, 2 0, 1 0 in the MAC. That's a big win in the MAC for them. Let's move on now. This is a big Western Buckeye League game between two undefeated teams, the Shawnee Indians and the Wapak Redskins. Wapak will win this 61 49 to go to 4 0. Kyle Huffman, 18 points, a couple of threes. Nick Schoonover, he had 14. Aaron Good, 13. You know, they just they made 10 three-point field goals during the course of the game. Did Wapak. Their defense gives up just 46 and a half points a game on the season. Shawnee led by Sean McDonald again. He had 15. They had 10 different players score. That's kind of a common theme for Shawnee now, but a good win for Wapak. Go 1-0 in a conference play. Let's go to Putnam County. Mark Shine and I had one of the yes, only two games in the area played that night. WSN cameras were at both. Miller City 65, Lipsick 55. Lipsick Grant Schrader had 20 points for Miller City. Noah Otto came off the bench, hit four threes, had 18 points, and Jacob Kuhlman played a great all-around game, had 17 points. Lipsick 3-1, and one, and they played two overtime games. Miller City now 3-1 and one because last night they beat Paulding. And let's move on to a big game in the uh, Northwest Central Conference. What could be the, the game of the year already, probably two of the top teams. This matches up Perry and Upper Soda Valley. A hard played, physical type game. Uh, Perry will win 71-61. Lane Harvey, Jacoby Lane Harvey with 28 during the game. You see him right there. Trevor Dotson was injured for USV and he is one of their primary interior players. Fell, apparently injured a hip or a lower leg of some type. But uh, he certainly is a key part to them. They were led by Wyatt Daniels with 22, including four from the three-point line. But that's a big, big win for the Perry Commodores in the, the conference, NWCC conference. We also want to take our plays of the week from that particular conference and look at them a little bit. They involve uh, Jacoby Lane Harvey and how well he handles the basketball and sets his teammates up on the first two. The third one, he gets a basket himself. So let's go to our highlights from that. The first one is just called a penetrating pitch. Harvey takes the ball in the basket. His teammate Logan Dre sets himself up on the three-point line, draws the defense, does Harvey. Here's the kick out. Watch him set his feet and nail that three ball from the top of the circle. That's Logan Dre with that one. Now the second one, Lane Harvey gets a screen from Kobe Glover. The defender reacts and helps. That leaves Dre open on the perimeter again. If you watch it again a second time, Harvey's defender goes under the screen requiring the second man to help, or at least think he does, and that sets up this three ball right here. And then finally, Mark, our third play, we talked about flex offense last week, and some teams like to run it from a baseline out-of-bounds play. That will get Harvey a three ball right here, coming off a, a Glover screen right there. Uh, Harvey will take the basketball out-of-bounds. They just run flex from the baseline instead of from the top of the circle. There's the pass. There's the first screen. Here comes the second screen. Look what a good job Glover does of forming up. Could have thrown the ball down inside. Instead, Harvey nails a three ball for three of his 28 points in the game and a USV victory. Kobe Glover, that body was made to block. He's a big young man, picks, isn't he? And he yep. certainly has got great hands and plays well inside, too. Hey, let's look at a where are they now segment. And for this uh, week, we want to look at Mark Bishop. Mark Bishop graduated from Elida in 1995. He had eight letters while he was there. Four in basketball, three in baseball, one in football. He had 12 threes in one game as a sophomore. That still is number six on the all-time list in Ohio for most threes in a game. And he's number three in career threes. He had 297 made threes in high school. Hard to even imagine. As a senior, his team went 20 and three. He made all WBL, all district, all Ohio mention. And in 2016 was put into the Elida Hall of Fame. Then after Elida, he went to the University of Findlay, had a pretty good career up there too. All-American in 97 and 99, number nine still today on their career scoring list with 1,658 points, still number one with career threes. He had 313 in college. He had over 600 threes in high school and college. Yeah. I've never even shot 600 <laughs> times. He also was put into the Hall of Fame in Findlay in 2011, 
has worked at Marathon and Finley for years and years. Sixth year this year as a head coach at Van Buren. They're not bad. There's four and O's right now. I've got a really good team up there. Family, wife Erica, four kids. Allie is 12. Jake is 11. Cole is 8. Mark is 6. Had that girl and three boys. I bet yeah. there's a lot of basketballs being dribbled in that house. That's a really fine yeah. player. A guy who started out as being a three-ball shooter, but by the time he graduated, could do everything on a basketball yeah. court. And you know, we, we don't have stats for this, but what a fine young man. Oh, All three of absolutely. my young fellas growing up when he was in high school, he was their hero, yeah. and he knew how to treat young kids. He'd high-five them, and he'd talk to them. Unlike a lot of high school kids that think they're in their own yeah. world, Mark was a very nice young man. And talking about guys who are great young men, last week we did Doug Etzler, and I was corrected by one of our viewers. I said that Doug Etzler won an NWC championship all of his years in high school. He did not win his junior year. Upper Soda Valley defeated Crestview in that particular season, Doug's junior year, to win the conference championship. Crestview got the revenge, though, in the tournament, beat them out in the tournament, but they did not win all four years. All right, good job. Yep. Yep. Hey, this week we got a rule explanation. Mark's going to put we his do. official's hat on. We're going to talk about over and back. Very confusing, especially it, after they change it a few years. It really is, and there's going to be a couple things we're going to look at as we go through the highlights here in just a second, Mark. One of them is when you take the ball out of bounds on the side or on the baseline, you can throw the ball into the backcourt. That's one play we'll look at. The other thing is... There's a three-point rule. You must get both feet and the basketball across the, the, into the front court and then go back into the back court becomes, before it becomes a violation. We have a play that shows that, too. These all come from our game last week when we had, uh, um, let's see, this is uh, Waynesfield and Ridgemont. You can see dribbles the ball off his leg into the back court. That becomes an uh, over and back call. You see the official on top of it right there. This is a sideline out of bounds, perfectly legal to throw the ball into the back court here. Um, you see teams do it also from the baseline, throwing the ball into the backcourt. Now, here's the three-point play. That young man put one foot over the midcourt line, but not all three. See his right foot's over the line, not his left, not the ball. So he can dribble into the backcourt. Thank you, Ben, for doing that. And dribble into the backcourt, that's completely legal. He did not have all three part points in the back. This one's just the opposite. This young man catches the ball, establishes position, and then dribbles over the line into the backcourt. That is a violation over and back. The rule is oftentimes misunderstood. Is. All right, good job. Appreciate there that explanation. Go. All right, over the holidays, you know, maybe a reduced schedule somewhat, but still a lot of games. They play yep. some midweek games, and we, and we want to uh, highlight or at least preview a few of those. Mark's going to start off with Crestview at Miller City. Let's look at Crestview at Miller City. Now, Crestview Knights, because of the late start from football, they're 2-0 and right now. They're 1-0 and in conference play. They have a game on Tuesday night with Fort Jennings at home, which could obviously change that. They're scoring 52 and a half points a game. They give up just 44. That's typical of what Coach Best likes to do, very solid defensively. They're led by Stout with 16 and Etzler with 12 and a half points a game and a lot of balance after that. A guy we know for football, Drew Klein, handles the ball to the point, plays solid defense, doesn't score a lot, but can when he needs to. Miller City, on the other hand, as Mark said, they won last night over Paulding. They're 3-1 now, 1-0 in the PCL. Jacob Kuhlman, 14 points a game. Noah Otto's 12 three-point field goals already through four, four games. Mark Kuhlman with eight, a 12.8. Miller City has won this game the last two years by 8 and by 10. Let's see if it's Crestview's turn this year. All right, on Friday also, Marion Local at Shawnee. Marion Local is 1-0. and Of course, they got that late start because of football. And then their one win was a real quality win. They beat St. Henry 61-53. Mesher had 15, Bruns had 12, and a little bit like Shawnee, they had nine guys score in their game, and that's a really good win for Marion Local, but it is their only win. Shawnee is 3-1, and started off 3-0, and won the tip-off classic. And then their last game was at Walpaw, or against Walpaw at Shawnee, and they lost. Their leading scorer is Sean McDonald. Mark told you a little while ago he leads them every game scoring. Okay, when we got Perry on uh, the Wednesday the 28th goes to play at Wapak. Now, Wapak stumbled a little bit last night with a loss to Minster, 44-38. Uh, an odd, obviously, a Monday night game set up because of football. Seven different players for Wapak have made a three-point field goal this year. But they were averaging 60.8 points per game going into last night's game with Minster. Got just 38. We'll see if that's an aberration or not. Uh, Perry has Shawnee on the 20th, Van Wert on the 23rd, Wapak on the 28th, as they have really upgraded their schedule. They have Bath a little bit later on. We've already talked about Jacoby Lane Harvey, Monford 15.8, Glover 13.5, Gardner with 9.3. Um, this is a big game, I think, for Perry to prove that they belong and are one of the elite teams in our area and big competition for Wapak as well. And then we got another one coming up, Mark, that I think is, is a really great, great one to add. Yeah. 
Middletown at Lima Senior. Now, for those of us who are old time, and I do mean old time, <laughs> Lima people, this goes back a long, long time. The rivalry hasn't been consummated recently. This is bringing it back right now. They brought it back in football a couple of years ago. This will be on the 30th. Uh, Middletown does not play until then. Uh, they are 2-2 two and two right now with wins over Princeton and Coleraine. A loss to Sycamore, a loss to uh, Lindhurst Brush as well. So they're 2-2. Two and two. Lima Senior, big game on Tuesday the 20th at Toledo Central Catholic. They also go to Elida. Jar Ward is averaging 23 points a game for the Spartans. No one else is in double figures. Their defense has given up 69 and 71 in their two losses. You know those are things that Coach Simpson is going to work on. Big game coming up, and glad to see that rivalry coming back between Middletown and Lima Senior. All right, well, we talked about being only five days from Christmas, and Mark and I, this is a, one of our yeah. favorite times of year, yeah. certainly, and, and Mark was at Ridgemont, and he saw an early Santa sighting. So, Mark, what do you well, think? Well, if that? we can get this up on Santa Claus, who we actually thought was, should be a little bit busy right now, but <laughs> Santa Claus was at the game, sitting in midcourt in a Ohio State Buckeye shirt, and I'm thinking, there he is right there. There's the, the guy, you know, he's got elves, I think, or something on both sides of him there. You would think he'd be a little bit busy this time of year, but we're glad to see get out to a basketball game and enjoy that before <laughs> his big uh, December 24th trip around the world. And oh, <laughs> glad man. to see that. Well, I and hope he doesn't mind now. us ca calling him Santa. That's for sure. <laughs> All right. right. Well, we just want to go through a few of our stuff here. The favorite Christmas movies. Okay. You know, there's a lot of them out there. Mark, what's your favorite Christmas movie? Well, our family has two. Well, first of all, here's a pet band from Ridgemont, Teresa Durant. This is one of the best pet bands, small school. Mark, this is one of the best pet bands that I have been around. They're small, they're active, they're, they got a lot of noise to them, their percussion's outstanding. And Teresa Doran, we really appreciate Ridgemont and the pet band and the great facility we were at the other night as well. They play any Christmas songs? They did not, and that's a good thing. All right, well, we're going to All right, we're good. All right, what's your favorite our, Christmas movie? Our family every year has, has one movie that we all watch together as a group, and that is The Muppet Christmas Carol. Now, not just The Christmas Carol, I know there's lots of versions of that. We think The Muppet Christmas Carol is is by far the best. There we go. There's a couple scenes from this right there. You go. How about that? Michael Caine playing Scrooge and obviously Kermit the Frog and all those guys. My other favorite is National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. Oh. I tried to watch it last night and the cable went out. My two favorite. There you, you, you know go. There's, my heart though, there's, right? I do. There's Clark. I really oh. love Cre Cousin Eddie. I think he just yeah. makes the whole thing go. And there are so many things in that movie that we've all dealt with in the past that. Uh, it's outstanding. Uh, that's a classic. Right, I, I've got, got a couple, and I know this is one of your favorite, too, Elf. Oh, no, yeah. Mark hates Elf. Can that's I stand that's... Elf? Will Ferrell. Anything with Will Ferrell, you well, got to laugh, right? Will Ferrell and Buddy the Elf. This is one of those things that if, <laughs> if execution were possible, we should do it. Wake a great no, Saturday Night no, Live no, skit no. for two minutes. It's hey, a bad full Sometimes movie. you just got to uh, just relax and just laugh at stupid okay. stuff. You're hey, the other movie I, we, I like is Grinch, the original Grinch. Right. All right. Now, that one was a little scary. But it, it was pretty cool. So that, that's my two favorite. All right, let's Christmas music. So Christmas much music. great Christmas oh, music. What well, you I'm, I'm not a real fan of Christmas carols, and I will admit that. What I do like is the Trans-Siberian Orchestra. If you've not ever seen them, my family and I saw them a few years ago. Their Christmas stuff is outstanding, and it, particularly when they do Carol the Bells. That, that's just yeah. super. And I really like the Alleluia Chorus that comes from Handel's Messiah. I think that's just music yeah. we ought to all have in church every Sunday yeah. when we have the, the, the yeah. Christmas season. What well, I, one of my favorite songs is Amy Grant's Emmanuel. Yep. Just gets me. I, I like that. I like Johnny Mathis. And, you know, our young guys are saying, who's that? <laughs> and Nat King Cole, he's even older than Johnny Mathis. And then you and I both like anything with Fa La La. In it, oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. In fact, my family knows this from the time my daughters were as small as can be. No matter what Christmas carol you sing, I sing Fa La La La. <laughs> And like we said, you, everybody knows the first verses of a Christmas carol. Right. Nobody knows the second verses, so we can just sing along, follow la, 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 and, and we're good to go. All right, how about Christmas traditions? Got Christmas any shine tra family uh, traditions? Well, we do, but before I get to that, one of my favorite traditions is called the Silent Night. It actually started at Taylor University, and what happens is the last basketball game before the kids go home for, for, for Christmas vacation, they game's going on, nobody in the stand says a word. It is dead quiet. When the team, Taylor scores their 10th point, the crowd erupts and they have this huge cheer goes on. When the game is over, the president of the university reads the Christmas story to them out of the Bible, and then they all have hot chocolate and, and cookies and whatever. It's a great tradition. My daughter went one year when she was at Indiana Wesleyan, went over to Taylor. It's a great tradition. That's where it all got very started. Cool. And yeah, we, we cool. always go to the Christmas Eve service at church. We think that's one of the outstanding things mm -hmm. to do. How yeah. about you? A lot of fun. Well, when the kids were young, I always read them the, the Christmas story yep. from the Gospels, and I always I had written it down by combining some of that, and, and I had a, a friend that was uh, 
an artist, and we were going to put together a little booklet so I could read it every year, and she passed away, and we never got that done. But just uh, now that they're big, I want to start reading to my grandkids oh, there now. you go. Yeah, that's right. Hey, we've got three guys that, uh, without them, w yep. we're just bumbling idiots out here and probably are anyway. <laughs> but uh, we want to show, uh, you know, Ben, Ben, and, and uh, Garrett, our guys that, uh, in the back. There's Ben Reif and his family. That's uh, his mom and dad and a brother and a wife and a couple of kids. And then a brother and their, a wife that just got married last uh, May, I understand, Casey and Jackson. Now, that, that's Ben's wife and, and uh, main man there on the far left as you're looking at it. So that's Ben Reif's family. And we got, uh, uh, this is Ben Phipps, uh, our high school guy from Elida on the far right there, and his sister Sarah on the left, and parents Greg and Kathleen in the middle. And lastly is Garrett Mansfield and Carlina Miller. Uh, that's, uh, she's a good friend of the station too and has done a lot of work for us. But without those three guys, uh, we wouldn't be able to do anything. Yeah. We wanted to show you them and their families on Christmas. And Mark, that's really what this time of year is all about. You know, as the song says, it's a favorite time of year. Uh, faith, family, food, and I like to watch a lot of football. Yeah. And uh, it's just a great time to uh, be with family. And it's great to have a good friend too, my man. Merry yep. Christmas to Merry you. Merry Christmas to you. Hey, we are off next week. Yep. Enjoy your family. Here are the games that... Uh, the crews will be out doing and bringing your way. Find one there. We will be back with the closer look on January the 3rd. Let's all remember, Jesus is the true reason for this season. Merry Christmas, everyone. <laughs>